I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever and evermore. Amen. Please be seated. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my beloved, always. For he is infinite in his love for us. He is infinite in his mercy, compassion, in his grace. It is endless the way he loves us and the way he cares for all of us. Before we go on to our topic, and this is, I believe, uh, this series, mini series of lectures uh, titled Journey with Christ, and I believe we are now, this is the fifth uh, lesson uh, under the title of Journey with Christ. Before we go on to that this evening, we will leave you with this church hymn. Let us all bow our heads and close our eyes and contemplate on these beautiful lyrics and this hymn. God bless. Yeah. 
amen to that. And as we actually walking through this journey as well with the um, feast of our Holy Mother Mary, the Assumption of the Holy Mother, uh, we pray and ask our Holy Mother to intercede to her beloved Son to have mercy on His church and on the whole world. Through the intercession of the Holy Mother Mary, may the Lord Jesus reach out every soul that is suffering in this country of ours, our beloved country, Australia, and the entire world um, collectively. Through the intercession of the Holy Mother Mary, may the Lord Jesus reach out to every father, every mother, every child, every son, every daughter, every brother and sister, every human being, Christian and non-Christians. May the Lord Jesus reach out to all and heal the wounds and remove every sorrow, every affliction and every tea that is being shed from every single eye. May the Lord Jesus compensate that tear with joy and happiness. And may the Lord Jesus compensate every affliction with absolute comfort. May the Lord Jesus decimate this darkness that has infiltrated the entire globe. And may His divine, true light shine forth on this world and on His church for everyone to realize where the truth is. May the Lord have mercy on us all, my beloveds, and this pandemic to be gone, never to come back, right this moment, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Just a, a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we are having a contemplative prayer night. It's going to be at 7 p.m. tomorrow. It's a contemplative prayer night uh, for the feast of our Holy Mother Mary. Uh, it will be in three languages. It will be in English, in Assyrian, and in Arabic. Um, and it's a, 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 sh a small prayer, contemplative prayer night for our Holy Mother Mary. Tomorrow, Saturday at 7 p.m., we pray that uh, we will see you. You'll join us uh, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Also, with Food Hampers, under the initiative of Food Angel, we would like to inform you that at the beginning of this month, August, we said that we were going to uh, cover the four, uh, four Wednesdays in the month of August till the end, but we actually have extended it for next Wednesday, which is the 1st of September. We are again giving um, hampers, uh, food hampers for free, uh, to reach out to as many families as possible where we know and we believe uh, so many families are having it extremely tough during these lockdowns uh, and during these hardships. So we are extending it for another week. So next Wednesday, the 1st of September, again, we will be giving, um, I believe it's around 150 hampers uh, for free uh, between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. here at the church location. So all those families that are in need, you're more than welcome to come and receive your free uh, food hamper. This is the grace of the Lord, and this is the help through the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus, and we are always indebted to Him forever. My beloveds, last Friday we, we spoke about Genesis chapter 3, and we talked about the Garden of Eden, and we spoke about the different types of trees there were that the Lord God had placed in the Garden of Eden. We said there was the trees which the Lord God said to our father Adam that you can eat from them, and those trees, they represent the body. The tree of life, which was in the center of the Garden of Eden, which symbolically represented, represents the Lord Jesus, uh, that tree is for the nourishment of the spirit. And there was another tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that tree represented the soul. And this is the human body made out of body, soul, and spirit. And the Lord God said to our father Adam, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
for the day you eat from it, surely you shall die. And that tree represented the soul, and that soul is me and you. So the Lord God said, the day that comes that you and I rely on ourselves, not on God, our beginning will be good, but our end will be evil. We will destroy ourselves as we can see what the world is doing. It is self-destructing itself. Because today, the generation of the 21st century has become extremely godless generation. They want to do it on their own without God. People do not want to know about God. They are not interested. People do not want to seek God. They are seeking life their way away from the Almighty God. Unless we come back to this God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there is no life. The end is going to be evil 100%. I am praying for Sydney. I am praying for Melbourne also especially. And for every city and for every country without any differentiation that are going through extreme measures of lockdowns and so-called pandemic. And I will call it plandemic. Melbourne is having it extremely tough. And this is an advice to the premier of Melbourne or Victoria. The premier of Victoria needs to know one thing. And every premier and every prime minister and every minister and every president and every king and every church leader sooner or later we will have to face our creator and give an account to what we are doing and what we've been doing we will give an account now whether you believe there is a God or not I can assure you and I am putting my life on the line for this I can assure you there is God I can assure you, you will have to answer to your, to your God. And this God, I can assure you, is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ has got nothing to do with Christians. Jesus Christ has got nothing to do with anyone. Jesus Christ is God, and this truth will always be the truth. Whether you believe in him or not, this will never change who he is. He is always the sovereign authority and he is always the truth. We will give an account and an answer to our creator, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So to Daniel Andrews, you'll need to revisit yourself, my dear friend, for what you're doing is beyond, beyond measures. Beyond measures. Stop hurting your people. A father, a father that hurts his children is not a father. A mother that hurts her children and enjoys hurting them is not a mother. A church leader that hurts his own children is not a church leader. A president, a king, a prime minister, a premier, anyone who holds a position and looks after people, if they enjoy hurting their own people, then they are of evil origin. They should not be there. So now I am saying to the governor general, sack the government, sack him. This is a message to the governor general. You need to sack such government. For what they're doing is inhumane. I just wonder, are they aliens or are they normal human beings? And when I say aliens, I'm not saying there is UFOs. None of this nonsense, okay? None of this nonsense. I am saying, are they really humans? Or have they lost touch of humanity altogether? 
What is happening is absolute ridiculous disgrace. Shame on such leaders. Shame on you. Lockdowns never work. The virus is increasing. Your statistics are saying it's increasing. Where is the lockdown working here? Little children can't even go out and enjoy life. And now, and now you have divided people. Division is from Satan. The Lord Jesus said, you should look at the tree and know the tree from its fruits. If, it's, if the roots are good or bad, the fruits will tell you if the roots are good or bad. The roots are hidden under underground. You can't see the roots with your own naked eyes, but you can see the roots through the fruits. You cannot see what's inside of a human being, but you can tell what kind of a, a thing is inside of them from their own actions and deeds, whether they are of good origin or evil origin. And the fruits and the actions and the deeds that we are seeing nowadays, it is absolutely of evil origin. People are going out, protesting peacefully. Look what the police are doing to them, viciously attacking them. Shame on you, Daniel Andrews. Shame on you. And shame on every premier that is like you. Have you no heart? Have you no feelings? Have you sold your soul to Satan? Money, yeah? Money talks. You will give an account to Jesus Christ. I pray for every human being that lives in Melbourne, in Victoria. I pray for everyone that lives in Sydney and in New South Wales. You are in our prayers. We know it's a difficult time, but the truth shall prevail very soon, very, very soon. Coming back to our topic, Genesis chapter three. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where the Lord God warned Adam not to eat from it, he ate through his wife Eve. And they got kicked out of the garden. And we said, Eden in the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Syriac language means joy, happiness, uh, praising, thanksgiving. And it also means a moment. It is a moment where you as a human being, you are in the presence of God. God is always present in your life. But the question is, are we present in his life? Are we present in his presence? He is with us, but are we with him? That's the question. So Eden is the moment where I am in the presence of the Lord. And when I'm, whenever I am in his presence, then I am alive, I am happy, I am joyous, and all the goodness will come uh, into my life. The day I lose Eden, I lose that moment in the presence of the Lord, I have lost life, I have lost everything that is good, and everything that is going to remain in me afterwards is nothing but evil. Now we're going to come and let us look again at Genesis chapter 3. This is a continuation from last Friday's. In, um, I'm going to give you 10 points what took place in the Garden of Eden. Number one, the enemy said in Genesis 3.1, in Genesis 3.1, the enemy said, has God indeed said, has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
The enemy will always come to put a deceptive statement. The enemy will always try to falsify the truth. Look how he deceivingly coming, trying to change what God has said. God said to Adam, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from this tree only, don't eat from it. Look at Satan. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan, your little sneaky thing. God never said, you cannot eat from every tree. God said, from only one tree you cannot eat. But look how Satan twists the story like the mainstream medias of our time and age. And so many leaders, they twist the truth and falsify the truth. Has he really said, don't eat from all of the, all of the trees? The first thing, please pay attention. The first thing Satan will try to infiltrate the human being with is suspicion. Now pay attention. The first thing Satan will try to infiltrate your head, your heart, is suspicion. Did really God say don't eat from all the trees? He wants you to fall into this trap called suspicion. You begin to say, hang on a sec, did God really say that? I don't know. I need to revisit what God said. He will make you suspicious of the promise of God to you and for you. He wants you to be suspicious of God's promise for you. Why? Because suspicion is the number one killer of faith. This is very important, my beloved. Suspicion is the number one killer of faith. Looks like I'm going to be stuck on this first point. <laughs> it is amazing when you come and start you start submerging yourself into the Word of God. The Word of God is like this ocean of ever-flowing living water. But this ocean is endless, no beginning, no end to it. No matter how much you swim, no matter how far and deep you swim, you will never fully fathom the fullness of the Word of God who is the Logos, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy name. Now, suspicion is the number one killer of faith. Destroys faith. When you read, when you read in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, which is the last chapter, the Gospel of John is in, the, is in the New Testament for those who are not aware how the Bible, Holy Bible is structured. It's the New Testament. So in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, the last chapter, look how the Holy Spirit is inspiring John the Beloved to write. The Lord Jesus is revealing himself to the disciples the third time after resurrecting from the dead. After he had risen from the dead, he revealed himself the third time to his disciples. In total, the Lord Jesus revealed himself to the disciples 10 times in total after he rose from the dead. It took 40 days. He remained on earth for 40 days. And during those 40 days after resurrection, he revealed himself 10 times. The third time was in the Gospel of John chapter 21. The Bible says, the Holy Bible says, and there was Simon Peter, first, number one, Simon Peter, one, Thomas, two, three, um, Bartholomew, 
Bartholomew, four, um, and the two sons of Zebedee, five, and other disciples. Look at the order, so beautiful, so eloquently put. Simon Peter one, Thomas two, Bartholomew three, sons of Zebedee, which are John and James, sons of Zebedee four, and other disciples five. The Holy Bible puts it in the Gospel of John in five order, in, in five sequences. Number one, Simon Peter. He puts Simon Peter, this is not our topic, but in a nutshell. Simon, the weak one. Peter, the strong one. Simon, born of earthly parents. Peter, born of his heavenly father. The strong one. Simon, the one who denied the Lord. Peter, the one who stood in the temple before the priest and the Pharisees and the scribes. And he says, you who have denied him, I am the eyewitness of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He spoke like a lion. Powerful, the rock. And then he comes, number three, Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Let's look at Simon Peter. What did Simon Peter say when we go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16? The Lord Jesus asked his disciples, he said, What do people say about me, I the Son of Man? Simon Peter jumps and he said, You are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm just cutting it short. You are the Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The Lord Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not flesh or, or, or blood had revealed this to you, but it is my Father who art in heaven. Blessed are you that you believe that I am Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you. Therefore, your name from this moment onward shall be Peter. So who named Simon Peter? Jesus Christ, who is God revealed in the flesh. Who named Simon, Simon, his earthly parents? And who named him Peter? His heavenly parent, Father in heaven. So Simon here in the Gospel of John chapter 21 represents the intellect. Let us look at number three, Bartholomew, which is Nathanael, one of the 12 apostles. Bartholomew, he said exactly the same thing in the Gospel of John, chapter one at the end of it. He said exactly the same thing as Simon Peter had said in Matthew 16, but Bartholomew added something else to what Simon Peter said. He said, you are the king of Israel. So Bartholomew added to what Simon said, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, Bartholomew added another statement to it. You are the king of Israel. Bartholomew represents the heart. Simon Peter represents the intellect. Bartholomew represents the heart. And as someone put it so beautifully, he said, the shortest distance to bridge is the hardest distance to do so. The shortest distance is between the intellect, the brain, and the heart. This is so short, yet so difficult to bridge and connect. The intellect says one thing, the heart says totally the opposite. We struggle between what our brain tells us and what our heart tries to reveal to us. The brain speaks logic, one plus one equals two. The heart speaks feelings and emotions. One plus one equals one. Figure this one out. The heart speaks against logic because feelings, emotions don't go hand in hand with logic. They are two parallel lines, never meet. So the intellect speaks one language and the heart speaks another. Simon Peter, intellect. Bartholomew, the heart. Look how the Holy Spirit puts Thomas between the intellect and the heart, and Thomas here represents suspicion. Because when the Lord rose from the dead and he walked through 
those closed doors and windows in that upper room where there was 120 people gathered there and our sweetheart mother Mary was one of the 20 people 120 she was the number one the Lord walks through those closed doors and windows and he says peace be with you my peace I give unto you Thomas was not there the first time the Lord reveals himself to the 120 souls gathered in that upper room. When Thomas comes, the apostles tell Thomas that Jesus truly is risen. He is truly risen. We saw him, he came into this room. What did Thomas say? He said, I will not believe unless and until I see with my own eyes and I touch with my own hands. Then I'll believe. The Lord comes another time, and this time the Lord made sure that Thomas was there. He comes again through closed doors and windows, and he calls Thomas to him. He says, come and touch, put your finger in my wounds, in my side. I don't want you to be a non-believer, but a believer, Thomas. But I'll tell you one thing, Thomas. Blessed are those who did not see yet believed in me. Blessed are they. Thomas suspected the resurrection of the Lord, forgot that Jesus told them, foretold them prior to the crucifixion, listen my disciples, I'll be handed over to authorities, they're going to judge me, they're going to sentence me to death, the death of the cross, I'll be crucified, I'll die in the flesh on the cross, I'll be buried, but I will rise on the third day as it is written in the scriptures. Who made Thomas suspect? Satan. Just like he made our mother Eve in the Garden of Eden suspect what God had promised. When you lose, when you have suspicion, you lose your faith. Another story. Today I'll stop on number one. It's very important. I can't just skip it. When you read in the Gospel of St. Matthew and St. John in, re in, in regards to Mary Magdalene, where the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene and the other women who were with Mary Magdalene. When you read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. Matthew says that Mary Magdalene and the other women came and touched the Lord's feet after he rose from the dead, after he rose. He allowed them, he allowed Mary Magdalene and the other woman to come and touch his feet and they kissed the Lord's feet after he rose from the dead. That is according to St. Matthew. You read in the Gospel of St. John, you see a totally different story. So some people, when they are not aware of what's happening, they say, look, there is contradiction in the Holy Bible. Far from it, my beloved. The Holy Bible is perfect because it is the Word of God and the true Word of God. When you read in the Gospel of John, it says that Mary Magdalene did not recognize him. He, she, she thought he was the gardener. When he called her Maryam, Mary, she recognized him through his voice. She called him Rabuli. Rabuli in Hebrew or Aramaic Syriac means the teacher of all teachers. That is what Rabuli is. He is not only a teacher, but he is the teacher of all teachers. She came to bow and kiss his feet the Lord did not let her he said you cannot touch me hang on a sec but Lord you let her touch you in the gospel of Matthew how come you are not letting her touch you in the gospel of John aha uh -huh. because John the gospel of John picks up this story through the second half of it so what happened when the first time Mary Magdalene and the other women see the Lord resurrected, they recognize him. They go bow down, touch his feet, and they kiss his feet. The Lord said to them, go and tell my brothers, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Go and tell them. 
So Mary Magdalene is going to tell the apostles. Halfway through, Satan comes and whispers in her ears. Are you out of your mind, Mary? Do you really believe that someone, someone dies and then rises from the dead? Are you a lunatic? Do you know what's going to happen if you go and tell the disciples that Jesus is truly risen? He is not dead. They will make fun of you. They will ridicule you. They're going to see you as crazy out of your mind. But obviously Satan does not reveal himself. He comes in a sneaky way, indirectly, puts all these evil assumptions, very dark assumptions in your head. He wants, you to, he wants to turn you against others, even against your own God. He wants to shape that picture as an ugly one. So she got suspicious. She started thinking between herself, with herself. She said, hang on, I must be crazy. How could I believe what I saw is true? There is no such thing as someone dying and then rising from the dead. This is, this is crazy, crazy. You know what? Before I go and tell the disciples that Jesus is truly risen, let me go back and double check. I want to confirm what I saw is truly what I saw. So the Gospel of John picks up the story as Mary is coming back to double check if Jesus is truly risen. When she came back, why did the Lord Jesus this time stop her from touching her? Because she came back with suspicion. What did suspicion do to Mary? Killed her faith. The moment you lose your faith in Christ, you cannot see him anymore. You cannot touch him anymore. You cannot recognize him anymore. It is through faith only we get to recognize him and we are allowed to embrace him and kiss him. So when she came back, she came back faithless. And without faith, what did the Lord say? Mary, stop there. You cannot touch me. I allowed you in the Gospel of Matthew to touch me because you came with faith. But since you did not believe in what I said, and you did not go and tell the apostles, you came back halfway through to double check if I am the true Christ risen, then you know what? You're not going to touch me. I won't let you until you go and tell my disciples that it is me and I'm truly risen. Then you will touch me. Suspicion kills faith. When you lose your faith, you lose your Christ, God. You lose Him. And the Song of Solomon, which is one of the chapters of the Old Testament, and the Song of Solomon, or, or also it is referred to as the Song of Songs, and the Song of Solomon talks about the neck. When you look at St. Paul in the New Testament, his epistle to the Ephesians chapter 5, he says that the church and the church here are all the baptized souls in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Every baptized soul, every Christian is the church of Christ. He says, the church, which is the Christians, baptized souls, are the body of Christ, are the body. And he says, St. Paul, and Christ is the head of this body, of this church. So the church is the body, and Christ is the head. Now my question to all of us, what connects the head to the body? The neck. What connects the head to the body, the neck. How are we connected to Christ in faith? So what is the neck in the Song of Solomon symbolically represent? Faith. We are connected, we, the church, the body of Christ, we are connected to Christ, the head, through the neck, 
faith. But guess what? Neck is the weakest member in the entire body. The neck is the weakest member in the entire body. You break someone's neck, that is a fatal wound. You are, you are paralyzed for, your, for the rest of your life. If you don't die, that is. That is very fatal when someone's neck gets broken. It's extremely fatal. It could lead to death. And if that person miraculously survives, it could lead into being paralyzed for the rest of their life. Far from all of you. The neck is the weakest member. Satan, please pay attention. Satan tries to get through any human being through their weakness to get to their spirit and bring it down and kill it forever. Take it to hell. The Lord Jesus comes through the weakest possible way in that human being to save that spirit and give it eternal life. Satan works through your weakness and God works through your weakness. But we thank God that he works through our weakness, not through our strength. What was the weakness of Eve for Satan to come and be able to put suspicion in Eve and make her go against her husband and through her husband Adam against God? What was her weakness? The Holy Bible says, and Eve was walking alone in the garden. The secret word in our weakness here is alone. What is happening in the world? The Lord Jesus said, you can tell a tree from its fruits if it has good roots or not. The fruits that or the deeds, the actions that are happening on a global level today, we could tell what kind of a fruits they are. They are absolute evil. You know why? Because to make a person vulnerable, make that person alone. Lockdowns. Lockdown is a way or a tactic that Satan uses. Lockdown is a fruit of Satan. Jesus, his fruits are very vivid, very clear. Jesus came to set us free from every lockdown, from every bondage, from every slavery, from every darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. His fruits are very clear and Satan fruits are very clear as well to those who have Christ in their hearts. The Lord will reveal to you Satan's agenda. He will reveal it. But those who are asleep, those who are distant from God, they won't know what has hit them. They won't even know. When you lock a person, that person begins to feel alone. When any one of us begins to feel alone, automatically they are weak. Automatically they are vulnerable. Automatically fear enters them, fear. And that is the next point. Suspicion kills faith. And when faith disappears, fear engulfs the person. You become a very fearful person. You, you begin to turn behind you and see who is following you. You'll be afraid of your own shadow. You hear a whisper, you jump out of fear. F-E-A-R. So, suspicion destroys faith. Faith disappears. Fear enters. When fear enters, you will lose track of God and his promise. So Eve was walking what? 
alone. Look how the Holy Bible talks beautifully. The Holy Spirit is not wasting his time nor our time to say that Eve went on a picnic in the garden. No, my dear friends. The Holy Spirit is trying to send a very foundational message for our spiritual well-being. Eve's problem, she walked alone, not with her husband. Looks like, looks like that Adam did not give Eve everything she needed, everything she lacked. So Adam was irresponsible as a husband, as a man towards his wife, towards his woman. He was not responsible enough. He left certain vacuums in, her, in his wife. He left certain, you know, emptiness in his wife. And any one of us, the moment we feel we are empty from inside, we will seek every alternate way to find a place where it can fill this emptiness. This is human nature. The moment we feel empty, we begin to look elsewhere. And that is the danger when we begin to look elsewhere. The Lord God said, Eve, you are safe and sound when you're with your husband. The moment you leave your husband and walk alone, you become vulnerable prey to the to the deceptive Satan who is like a roaring lion seeking any soul to devour it. And that's exactly what Satan did. He took the advantage of Eve being alone walking in the garden. He came as the serpent and whispered in her ears. And he said, did really God say you can't eat from all the trees? Come on. You can eat from it. God is selfish. Trust me, Evo. Yo, Eve. Trust me, brother. Eat from that tree. Listen to Satan. Don't listen to God. <laughs> Our time and age, people are listening to Satan, not to God. This God, Jesus Christ. People are listening to Satan. Everyone is suspicious of the other. Everyone sits in their, ro in their corner, in their room, and begin to assume things against other people. We assume things. If you've got a problem, just confront it. Don't assume things. That's evil. That is Satan way. We are the children of God. We are not of, of Satan. Step on Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Step on him. Get up, be strong, and say, For my Lord Jesus is with me. I will fear no evil. Away with you, Satan, in Jesus' mighty name. Be a warrior for Christ. Be a warrior. When you're alone, you're weak. Now this topic, this, this Garden of Eden is just one amazing story. It's not a myth, as some people think. No, it's reality. For all the entire Holy Bible is inspired by God. Genesis is not a myth. It's not. It's true. Suspicion. That was the first thing Satan did to the first human being on the face of this planet. At the very, very beginning, he planted suspicion. Because Satan is very smart in his own ways, but he cannot outsmart the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. He cannot. So he puts suspicion in us. 
destroyed faith and fear engulfed us. We became scared, vulnerable, weak human beings. My goodness, I thought I started five minutes ago. My apologies if I'm keeping you too long, but I'm enjoying it, I'll tell you what. I don't want you to go. For the, for the next 10 hours, no, just kidding, the next 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about family. I want to talk about family. The very first thing the Lord God instituted on the face of this earth was marriage. The very first thing that the Lord God ever instituted on the face of this earth was marriage. The Lord God created Adam, and out of Adam he created Eve, the man and the woman. And we mentioned that last week. The man and the woman. By the way, I want to say this, it's important. The word human, the word human is of Latin origin, is of Latin origin. It is a compounded word, two words in one. It is humus man, humus man. The word humus in Latin means dust, earth. Man means spirit. So what is a human? He is the spirit in this flesh. The, the body. The body is humus because the body is taken out of the, the earth, out of, mother, out, out of the ground, out of the dirt, out of, out of the mud. So this body is called humus, which in Latin means earth, dust. Man means spirit. So what is the humus man or human is the spiritual side of him being placed in the physical side of him. The spirit in the flesh, living in the flesh. That is the human. For our spirit, for our spirit to be legal in this realm, it requires a physical body. Now why? When you read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, when you read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the Lord God said, let us go down and create this Adam, this man, in our image according to our likeness. When he said, let us go down and create man, in our image according to our likeness he created this man and he made him humus man he created a physical er earthly body and took the spirit from heaven and put it into this physical body when he said this the following is so profound my beloved the lord that or or Elohim, I should say. Elohim said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us give dominion to this man. Let us what? Give dominion to this man. And I'm going to just read it for you very quickly so you know what I am saying here. Look at this. Genesis 20, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Yeah? Male and female. <laughs> Very important. 
Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Who gave the dominion to this man who is human, humus man, body, flesh, and spirit dwelling in this flesh? Who gave the dominion to this human being? God himself. And he repeated the word dominion twice. One in verse 26 and the other in verse 28. The Lord God gave dominion to who? This humus man, the human. When God gave dominion, what does that mean? Meaning he gave the authority to the human being to do whatever they want to do on the face of this earth. He said, you have the dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle of the land, over everything that creeps on the face of this earth. You have authority. You are the sovereign king, Adam, over this entire earth and everything that is in it. And isn't that so? Look at the lion. If I fall into the trap of a lion, he will shred me to pieces. That lion will shred me to pieces. But look how we have dominion over a lion. We catch that lion and we put, him, we put that lion in a zoo and we make money out of caging the lion in a zoo. We, are, we outsmart any animal. We outsmart anything on the face of this earth. Where did we get this? intelligence where did we get this authority dominion from God vicious animals we trap him and trip him and then make him pets we build skyscrapers we dig the ground we bring minerals out of there we bring gold out of gold mines we bring diamonds we bring oil and then we kill each other <laughs> We have dominion. Who gave the authority? God. When God gives something, he will never take it back. When God gives something, he will never take it back. So Adam, now he has the authority over this earth. Satan is spirit. For Satan, for the spirit to be legal in this realm, the spirit must have a physical body. Just like this man's spirit needed a physical body to be legal in this earth, so as Satan being a spirit, he needed a physical body to be legal in this, in this planet, in this realm. So what did Satan do? He entered the snake. The snake at the time was not like the way we know the snake. It was a different creature. It was beautiful. So he enters a physical body in order for him to be legal as a spirit being, legal on earth, he needed to have or acquire a body. He enters through the body of that snake. He comes and whispers through Eve and makes her fall and with her, Adam, her husband. God is watching. God is spirit. He is watching what is happening, but God operates in perfection. He could not do anything at the time. He did not intervene, but he warned Adam, and that's what God did. Adam, don't eat from this tree. If you, de if you eat, you're going to die. Be careful, my son. I love you. Now, Adam didn't listen. He listened to the snake, to Satan. God did not intervene right there and then. But what did God do? He started preparing the way for the redemption and the salvation of Adam and all mankind and the entire world. There was an appointed time in history that God, the Spirit, will put on the flesh to become legal in this realm and crush the head of the serpent. That time was appointed in the wisdom of God, in the perfection of God. And until that time had come, God started sending prophets, patriarchs, 
holy people of God in the Old Testament until the New Testament came God said look what did God say to the serpent when serpent um, bluffed Eve and made Eve and Adam both fall of the glory of God look what God said to the serpent in Genesis 3 verse 14 and verse uh, and verse 15 14 and 15 so the Lord God said to the serpent because you have done this you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel because you done so ser serpent you're gonna go on your belly all the days of your life and you will eat what dust snakes eat the dust of the ground and they go on their belly other creatures have legs uh, the snake has nothing creepy crawly on the belly and eats dust and I'm gonna put enmity between look at this between you serpent and the woman which woman the Holy Mother my sweetheart my mother Mary I'm gonna put an enmity between you snake and the woman which is the Holy Mother and between your seed and the woman's seed who is her seed the woman Christ our Lord Jesus Christ so the Lord God in the moment where the serpent uh, be, uh, made Adam and Eve fall he came straight away to the serpent and he said this is what I'm gonna do you're gonna be cursed for all the days of your life on your belly you're gonna keep and uh, you're gonna crawl and you're gonna eat the dust, of, the dust of the earth and I will put enmity between you and the woman listen Satan you made my son Adam fall I'm not gonna interfere now because I am spirit and if as a spirit I come into this realm without a physical body I become illegal because when I gave dominion to this man he was humus man earth flesh and spirit at the same time this human had the spirit in this physical body I God I'm only spirit now I'll put on the physical body and I'll become a human where me as God the Spirit will be legal in this uh, in this realm I'll become a man I'll put on the body and when I put on this body guess what snake I'm gonna crush your head on Calvary on the cross for I Jesus Christ I am the seed of the woman Mary our virgin holy mother God came made a promise and he came and I need to go shortly God became legal in Jesus he's got a physical body now because to remain in this realm your spirit must have a physical body the day you lose that physical body the spirit has to go back to the spiritual realm cannot stay here because the moment the spirit on its own remain in this realm it becomes illegal there is no visa for it must be kicked out that's why when a person dies what is death the biological death the physical death the spirit departing from the body the moment the spirit departs from the body cannot stay here has to go to the spiritual realm so what happened the Lord Jesus died on the cross physically he was buried and he rose from the dead now Jesus went up and sat at the right hand of his father 
the human side of the Lord. Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary, son of the carpenter. The, the human, the perfect man got up and went up to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. Not the Son of God, the Son of Man sat at the right hand of the Father. Now Jesus is no longer with us on earth physically, but his spirit has to remain because Satan is not finished off as yet. Judgment hasn't come yet. So now Jesus in his spirit needs to be on earth. So what did he do? Through the holy baptism, one of the seven sacraments of the true church of Christ, through the holy baptism, in his spirit now, he dwells in his children, the Christian realm, the church. He remained legal on earth through his children, through the holy baptism. Now the Lord Jesus is fighting against Satan through us. God fought against Satan through Jesus, but Jesus went up. So now God is fighting against Satan through his children, us, the church. I'll leave you with this. The first thing God instituted on the face of this earth was marriage. Because it is through marriage you establish a family. It's amazing. So he created male and female. God, Elohim, created male and female. And out of male and female, family came. There is no other way. Family cannot exist with, unless there is a male and a female. I wish I had more time about this topic. I know I can't hear you, but can I talk? <laughs> or are you, have you had enough? Hello? <laughs> can you send a message, say, please talk, or Nana, please, enough? <laughs> send a message and they'll tell me. Uh, the beautiful media team here, they'll let me know. Yeah, talk? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You asked for it. <laughs> you owe me a fish burger and a chocolate sundae. No, just kidding. Um, so the Lord Elohim created male and female. It is out of male and female you can establish a family. Anything outside of male and female, it is no family no matter how many children you want to adopt. You know why? Because God created something in a male that is absent in a female and vice versa. He created something in a female that is absent in a male. Same sex parents have missing they have something missing whether males both males or both females there is there is imbalance what influences a male is logic what influences a female is feelings and emotions two males have logic no feelings emotions two females have feelings emotions no logic no matter how much you try to change your body, what God has done, my dear friend, you cannot create or uncreate. You go and speak to any psychologist. You go and speak to any psychologist. Is the influence of the man different to the influence of a woman? They'll tell you yes. Why? Because this is the way God <laughs> intended it to be. When a male and a female beca become parents, the picture is, is complete, it is perfect. That child needs both parents as male and female in order for that child to grow and flourish in a complete picture that makes a human a human. So the daddy gives the child logic, the mom, the mom gives the child feelings and emotions. When I run to my mom, seek her help, mom talks to me totally different to the way dad talks to me. You know what logic is? You go and ask your dad for something, yeah, no worries, son, go and get it. Or he'll say, 
be quiet, none of your business, get out of here, I'm not giving it. Period. Logic is very short, straight to the point. Logic is when you go shopping as a male, you want to buy something, you will go straight to that shelf, grab that thing, and out of that place as fast as you can. A woman goes shopping, good luck, my dear husband. If you go shopping with your woman, you will never hear the end of it. She wants to buy a glass or a vase. She'll take you to every shopping center. She will go to West Me, uh, Westfield Shopping Center in Parramatta. She'll take you through four levels. She'll take you to all the 5,000 shops that in that shopping center. And after 22 or 23 and 59 seconds, she'll say, oh, hubby, I found the vase. Okay, can we now buy it and go home? Poor husband is falling apart. Why does it take a woman to go throughout the shopping center to buy one thing that she intended to go for and get? Because women moves, lives, and pushed through feelings, emotions. She wants to feel things. She wants to touch things. She wants to smell things. Okay, let me look at the perfume. She's going to buy some shoes, but she'll go to the perfume. She'll go to the jewelry. She'll go everywhere because she is driven by feelings, emotions, and the male gets angry. Well, he can't get angry because that's the way God created her. And when God created her in this way, don't force to change it because you cannot, you are causing World War Three at home. Just go with it. <laughs> You'll be rewarded later. So the man goes straight to the shelf, get it and out of there. I don't have the time, that's logic. So the dad will say, grab it, yes and take it the mom will say come here my child why do you want this can you please explain to mommy why should I give it to you I want to smell I want to feel I want to touch after an hour long conversation she may say yes or she may say no logic feelings and emotions are the perfect picture to give your child God created, established marriage on earth. And through marriage, he intended to establish a family, establish a family. Satan, the first thing he attacked was family. The first thing he attacked was family. Because Satan knew that if I can destroy a family, I have destroyed society. If I can destroy a family, I have destroyed the church. If I can destroy a family, I have destroyed the human race because what makes up the human race is family. The foundation to the church, the foundation to society, the foundation to any culture, the foundation to any race, the foundation to every human race is family. Satan, in the very beginning of in the Garden of Eden, he attacked family and tried to destroy it. In the 21st century, Satan has come back again, attacking family to destroy everything else with it. Governments, in some countries now, because Parents who have contracted the virus, they are coming and taking their children away from them in the name of, we are protecting your children. You come and touch my children, I will shred you to pieces. Do you get that government? I will shred you to pieces in Jesus' mighty name. I will show you who Jesus Christ is. How dare you touch my children? How dare you? It is God who gave me the children, not you. Who do you think you are? Parents, listen up. Mom and dad, please listen up. This is the Lord. This is the voice of the Lord to all of you. 
the most beautiful thing God ever established on earth was family. The most beautiful thing. You know why? The most important thing to God is family. The most important thing to God is family. You know why? Because God himself is family. My question to you, when does a man become a father? When he has a, when he has a child? As long as you are married to your woman, you are husband and wife. The moment you have a child, the husband becomes father and the woman becomes mother. Father and mother are the highest rank ever to exist on earth. And by the way, let me tell you this, mom and dad. Every father and mother, your rank is greater than the Pope, than any church leader. The highest rank on earth in the eyes of God is the father and the mother, not the Pope, not the patriarch, not the church leader. It is the father and the mother. And to prove this to you, when the Lord God came to give the Ten Commandments to Moses, Exodus chapter 20, he said, respect your father and mother so that I bless you and give you a long life. The Lord God did not say to Moses, respect your church leader so I can bless you and give you a long life. Respect your so-and-so. No, he said, respect father and mother. He did not say, respect your government. Like some people come in a sneaky way and say it is written in the Bible that government is from God. Excuse moi it is not only government that is from God, everything is from God. Don't come in a satanic sneaky way and quote some verses and leave the others outside of the equation. Don't. It is not only the government from God, everything is. Everything is. Yes, everything. But this very God said to Moses, respect your father and mother, not respect your government, not respect your pope or your church leader, father and mother. Why? Because the only ones, mom and dad, please listen. The only ones that truly represent me on earth is the father and the mother because I am the ultimate parent. When you read in the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament, the Lord is, is revealing himself as the mother. He is saying in Isaiah, for if the mother forgets to breastfeed her babe, I, your Lord, will never forget you. He reveals himself as the mother. And, and in Matthew and Luke, Matthew 6, uh, Matthew, um, Matthew 6, 9 and Luke 11, 3, when the disciples came and asked the Lord Jesus to teach them how to pray, he said, every time you pray, you say, our Father who art in heaven. God is our Father in Matthew and Luke, and God is our mother in the, in the book of Isaiah. He is the parents, both mom and dad. So the ones who truly represent God on earth, mom and dad, you know why? Because it is only the father and the mother are co-creators like God is the creator. God creates people, mom and dad create children. The only people on earth that can create a human being is mom and dad, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Adam and Eve are the only humans that can create another human being. Wow. Mom and dad, you are co-creator with God. Look at the precious gift God has given you, mom and dad. Do not lose this gift. Please, I beg you, look after your children. Look after your children. I beg you. Do not be deceived by the enemy. Mom and dad, do not look at the world and the temptations of the world and forsake your children. Instill in them the fear of the Lord. Show them the way to Christ, my dear mom and dad. Teach your children on how to be warriors for Christ. 
Don't go out to the world and forget about your children. Spend time in equipping your kids, putting the armor of all true faith in them so that when they grow older, the current of the world will not sweep them away. They are equipped to be warriors for Jesus Christ, to be faithful and loyal children for the Almighty God. This is an obligation for every mom and dad. Mom and dad do not fight over material things. Mom and dad do not fight over temporal things. Mom and dad do not be focused on this vanity called the world. Do not be deceived by the enemy and chase the pleasures and the treasures of the world. What does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and at the end he loses himself? Mom and dad, do you know what is your inheritance in the next life in the kingdom of God? Do you know what your inheritance is? Do you know what is your treasure in the next life as mom and dad? The only, the only treasure that you're going to have in the kingdom of God at the end are your children. When you take your children with you to Jesus Christ, don't ever go as father and mother alone without your kids. Go and take your family with you. This is your wealth. This is your health. This is your treasure when your children are given back to God because he gave them to you to look after. Now the time has come for God to ask you for that possession that he's given you to look after. That is your child. You need to give back that child to God again. This will be your inheritance in the next life. When you take your family, dad and mom with you to Jesus Christ. When you take your family, don't let Satan come and devour them. You know why? When we look, when we look at families in the 21st century, oh my, 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 my goodness. Divorces are left, right, and center. I just wonder why do you go through the hassle of getting married? You were never meant to be married to, be, to end up in divorce. Marriage was intended by God so that his kingdom can expand on earth. It was through marriage God intended for his kingdom to expand on earth and eventually engulf the whole earth for him. I don't have time. I don't have time. We will continue, God willing, next week. We're still in Genesis chapter 3. And we haven't touched the surface. We haven't yet touched the surface. Family. Family, my beloveds. Family. The 21st century has lost touch of what family truly means, the value of the family, the principle of a family, the ethics and the morals of that family. We have destroyed this family. Satan once again came and whispered in our ears and made us lose track. So many divorces happening and have happened and are happening in our time and age for silly things, husband and wife, father and mother leave, leaving each other for stupid, silly things. Oh, I don't want to stay with my husband. I'm not happy with him anymore. He doesn't, he doesn't take me out. He doesn't buy me things. He doesn't give me what I want. 
I want to be like the rest of those people over there. I want to dress up in a different outfit every day. I want to drive a Ferrari. I want a diamond ring. I want a mansion. I want this. I want to fly. I want to buy. I... Please. This is nonsense. God put family not to chase materialism. God put a family to live for him because his family on earth is the kingdom of God. John Chrysostom, John, I'll leave you with this. John Chrysostom, who was a patriarch in the fourth century, uh, and he was the patriarch of the see of Constantinople. Constantinople is current Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey. Constantinople is Istanbul in Turkey, Asia Minor. He was the patriarch of Constantinople in the fourth century. In his beautiful, eloquent preachings, and the word uh, John Chrysostom, Chrysostom means the golden mouth. Chrysostom, the word Chrysostom means the golden mouth because the words that were uttered out of his mouth, they were nothing but gold, precious, 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 precious metal, gold. So they titled him as John Chrysostom, John with, with the golden mouth. He says, if you want to see the kingdom of God on earth, if you want to see the kingdom of God on earth, see a family that worships the Lord Jesus Christ. See a family that worships the Lord Jesus Christ. Father and mother, husband and wife, father and mother and children all together kneeling before the Lord and in their own house, in their own home, kneeling and worshiping the Lord. Sitting at one table before eating, thanking Jesus for the food that he put on the table through his grace. A family that worships the Lord Jesus is the kingdom of God on earth right before our own very eyes. And Joshua of the Old Testament, he said, but as for me and my household, we worship the Lord. Hallelujah. As for me, I, Joshua, and my household, we worship the Lord. This is the kingdom of God on earth. Not take me out to a restaurant, not take me out on holidays, not buy me a Mercedes Benz, not travel, not eat, not talk about your mother-in-law and your father-in-law and your cousin and your friend, and not chit-chat on Facebook and that and talk nonsense. A family must worship Jesus Christ. A family must reflect God on earth. A family is the kingdom of God on earth. May the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus heal every wound. May the Lord Jesus heal every broken family. May the Lord Jesus decimate Satan and his deceptive ways. May the Lord Jesus in bestow his love in every father's heart and in every mother's heart, in every husband and wife, in every household. May the love of all the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth come and engulf that family. And please, I beg you, make Jesus the head of your family. Make him the head of the house. Give him everything. Let him be in charge of your family. For he is the head of the house. He is, but we need to make him. We need to confess and profess this and acknowledge it in our own family. Invite Jesus to your family and say, Lord, you are the head of this household. You are the head of this family. We worship you. We thank you. We praise your holy name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue this topic, God willing, next week. Until then, may the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth be with you, my beloved. Be strong and be faithful to your Lord Jesus, no matter what it is. Leave everything in his capable hands and let him lead your life. For he is the creator of this life. He is the giver of this life. And he is the only true good shepherd that 
leads his flock, his sheep, to green pastures and still waters. He's the only one. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you always, our Lord Jesus. Um, I need to come up with some new jokes. I've run out of jokes. You know, I've been, I've been telling jokes for quite some time now. And I've, I've, I've run out of these jokes. Um, I was trying to think of some, and of one at least. I mean, last time I told you this joke, I hope it was funny. <laughs> about that job being advertised in India. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you this one. There was um, two Aussie sailors. They ended up in Great Britain. So the good old sailors, mate, the good old Aussie sailors, bro. So they went into the pub. That's the way, brother. So they went into the pub, and they had their time there. They came out totally drunk. So they're walking in the street of, of, of London, not knowing where they are and where they're heading. So one of the, one of the guy turned to the other one. He said, um, excuse me, mate. Um, can you tell me where we are? The other guy said, mate, I wouldn't have a clue. And as they were talking, there was this man coming towards them. He happened to be someone very high in the British Navy. So they stopped him. He said, oh, excuse me, mate. Um, can you please tell us where we are? The British guy, he looked at them and then he pointed his finger at him and he said, do you know who I am? He was very high in, in the Navy. He said, do you know who I am? One of the Aussie guys turned to his mate. He said, mate, we're in deep trouble. We don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> we're in trouble. Don't get drunk so you don't lose your sense of orientation. <laughs> Stay sober in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let us stand for the finale prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy, or divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you, God, you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Just before I leave you with this hymn again, and a reminder tomorrow at 7 p.m. we have this contemplative prayer, prayer night. It's going to be in three languages, English, Assyrian, and Arabic, um, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Also, next, this coming Wednesday, the 1st of September, we are giving again uh, food hampers for free. Uh, under the initiative of Food Angels here at the church location. May God bless you, guide you, protect you all the days of your life, and forevermore. Amen. We leave you now with this church hymn. Until next week, be in peace. The peace of Christ engulf you always. Amen.